So we wanted to open it up straight away for uh, reactions and a, and, a, and a conversation to to open up between the the panel here and and all of you um, there. So uh, perhaps some of you have have some reactions, and then we can start a conversation in in response to the three quite stimulating uh, talks this morning that you've heard. Uh, so. Right, yeah, please. You need to light the microphone. I guess you know. Yeah, my um, sort of comment or reaction is really the question whether, you know, the, um, this idea of, you know, the European um, citizenship is more than um, a utopian ideal. And I'll say a few things just to position myself. Um, so Roti started off talking about this question, or trying to convince us that it, it is not just dead, that it's, it's more than that, it's got a history, it's got a dream that needs to be continued. And um, Engin, he talked about the history of Europeanism and how it tended to be inclusive. But I would argue that it is this history that is our demise. Everywhere I look back in history, even back to biblical times, wherever the two groups positioned you know, together, two or more groups working together or living side by side, there's always been this need for one to dominate. In fact, Bourdieu writes about male domination that it is so rooted in our collective unconscious that we no longer see it. And I think it is this, this past colonialism and, and um, slavery, you know, this history that you now have groups that don't even have the intelligence to understand their rights, yet alone know how to enact these rights, that is actually our demise. So I need to be convinced that it is more than a European ideal, or a utopian ideal, sorry. Um. It's, it's a good reminder, uh, your question. Of course, history is always selective. There's no comprehensive way of uh, enacting history. We, we, we write and rewrite, rethink, and use, abuse uh, what we know of our own collective memory and memories. Um, there are, it's not a question of either or. It's not a question of there's only one type of history. There is, Yes, there is the history of colonialism, imperialism. There is the history of um, uh, expansion of the European citizenship ideals and so on. But also there are other things that we inherit from that history. It is our own choice to decide what kinds of things that we want to articulate as worth including in our heritage and what are the kinds of things that we actually want to uh, not maintain. European racism is also history. Racism is part of European history. It's not something that stands outside. But now the question for us is what position do we take toward that history? How do we make that history our own? What is our responsibility to history that we inherit? That is, I think, to me, the question of history. The other point you're making about domination, I mean, analytically thinking about these issues, in human history, we do find that, um, that social groups articulate themselves against each other along the spectrum of dominated and dominating. And the dominant groups, social groups, articulate their own values, their own particular characteristics as universal characteristics, and then they identify those values as being superior to those uh, who lack them. We see that in history of Orientalism. We see that in history of racism. We see that in history of classism. We, we see that in domination. But analytically, making that point and stopping there can also have sterilizing effect in the sense that if history, all history is history of domination, then what is to be done now? Um, to that, one has to not only uh, respond analytically, understanding the mechanisms of domination, but also politically. How 
these mechanisms of domination and subordination get overturned, how those uh, groups that get to be dominated um, and assigned into subaltern st status subversively and perversely, if you like, illegally and irregularly find ways of actually um, transposing the values that are imposed on them. So there's analytical values to be gained from those kinds of struggles as well. So there's that kind of history that we can read today. Then we can use the tactics and strategies, um, the um, uh, various mechanisms that subaltern groups, those that have been dominated, use. And, and what we can learn from that within the construction of European citizenship. So, for example, I do often make uh, comparisons between the way in which sans papier use creatively and subversively certain elements in their struggles against domination that they draw upon um, historical examples. So the example I gave, for example, on, on the um, medieval cities and a year and a day, if you like, is a subversive example because it is biblical, it is, comes from medieval cities, it has an aura of legitimacy about it. Yes, this is our history, but often medieval history, um, s medieval history of cities is not remembered that way. Often nationality, histories of nationals start in early modern period with the enlightenment, and the medieval period is considered as in modern imagination as dark ages. So it's a subversive example meant to bring up tactics and technologies that are available for subaltern groups to make alternative claims. And that's use of history as well. OK, uh, well, I, I've been trying to emphasize uh, union over European in the European Union. And that's because one of the things that we can learn from, from, from the, the, in my view, uh, uh, very important example or, or, or even uh, you know, idealistic example of the American Federation of the United States of America is that they have, in a way, uh, usurped, monopolized the name of the whole continent. Uh, uh, and this is something that I keep hearing from Latin Americans. Well, the United States are not America, they are the United States. I don't think that Europe should do the same. I think that we should emphasize the Union. So it's not, and it will also help solve some problems. It's not European values. They are values of the Union because the, the Union has decided that these values should be in the treaties. But democracy is not specifically European. It doesn't have to be. <laughs> Rather, it has to be non-territorialized if democracy has to have a sense. Uh, so I think that we should try to deterritorialize uh, the, the, the Union. Although there's a big part, you know, if you, if you think about it, for instance, the, 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 the Cape Verdean uh, candidacy to be, to, you know, to, to be a member of the Union was refused in the 80s, and then Cyprus was accepted in the 90s. There's a double standard there, because they are both non-European islands. Cyprus is not European, uh, continentally, geographically. Cape Verde also not. So what's the difference? What's the difference there? Well, uh, well, the color of the skin. The Cape Verdeans don't look Europeans to many Europeans, so it didn't make sense. But the Cypriots were Greeks, at least for the Greeks. So it made sense in another way. So these prejudices get uh, imbibed in political decisions the whole time. Maybe sometimes they are what forms political decisions. And what we have to do is to counter that with some kind of transnational pat patriotism about, about ideas, about values. You, can, you, you could call it the Voltairean Union, for all I care, or the Kantian Union, or whatever. Uh, that, that's why, going back to Ulysses, that's why I refer to Ulysses. Ulysses is one of my heroes, but he did a great deal of very bad things. Actually, that's why he, he gets all these problems in the Odyssey, because he invented the Trojan horse and invented the way to actually enter Troy and plunder and kill and massacre the town. 
and then the gods, of course, are not happy with that. They don't think that's that's a humane way of <clears throat> acting in war, and they, you know, spread all the the, the 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 the. There's a huge storm after the the Greeks win Troy, and Ulysses is lost, and then he becomes a wanderer and a traveler, and he learns with many different people of that experience and tries to solve problems not via conflict but via his uh, imaginative skills. So that's someone that we can have an, as an example, not because he had a, a, a perfect, immaculate past. He didn't. Europe did not, emphatically, emphatically did not have. If you go read Schumann's uh, speech about the reunification of Europe, you'll see that it's Europe and its colonies still there in, 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 in the beginning of the 50s. As, for instance, after World War I, the 14 points of Wilson, they are very idealistic. They talk about self-determination for European peoples under European empires. So for subjects of Austria and Hungary and for subjects of the Ottoman Empire, yes. For uh, colonial subjects in Africa, no. Uh, history was, in, was really far from perfect. That's why you should use it, I think. Thank you for an excellent question. <clears throat> the um, question of Europe is the question of its history. There is no difference. The, pro the question then would be, where do we ground that issue? And being academic, the first thing that we need to look at is, is which discipline we ground it in. In my discipline, philosophy, the question of Europe and the question of the history of Europe is the question of an idea. And the idea is universal human rights. So what philosophy has done from way back, and I think we can really go way back, I think you intimated that, um, if, we, if we believe that Europe began in Greece, it's already in Aristotle, if you want to, that Europe is an idea, is an aspiration of the human mind disengaged from any contingencies of spaces and times. And that idea is a complicated one. Among other things, it is at the heart of our education system. And there would be a reason why a federal university would be very difficult in Europe, but it's another story. So uh, if this idea is universalism, universal human rights, how do we account for it? And I think here we really need to bring in the input of what people call the radical epistemologies, and which I call the studies. Now, there are disciplines. And there are studies. History is a discipline. Gender studies is a study. Uh, sort of philosophy is a discipline. Ethnicity studies, post-colonial studies, and race studies, and, uh, conflict studies, peace studies are studies areas. And I think you can, in a sense, narrate the question of the crisis of Europe as an idea by tracking the development of studies area next to the disciplines in our own academic world since the 40s. It's a great exercise. So we need to bring in instruments from the radical epistemology from the studies areas and account for the partial truth of a certain idea of Europe. I don't say falsity, but partial truth. Universalism is a partial truth. In fact, it's a very parochial form of, 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 of particularism that Europe has brought into the world if you read this with post-colonial theory, feminist theories, Olympe de, um, de Gouges, um, uh, Toussaint Louverture, um, M. Césaire, and all the people who thought of the great European ideals from outside Europe. So what we need to do here is particularize our aspiration to universalism, still hold on to them, and show how different the readings of this can be. Doesn't mean that we give it up. <clears throat> they are much more sophisticated readings than we normally think of. Um, uh, you can read Fanon already in the, in the 40s and 50s as the person who taught Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir everything they were to then do about otherness. Fanon coming in from black theory, from, from um, absolutely the colonial thinking, a great humanist, well read in all the classics of European universalism, holding Europe accountable for the extent to which we ourselves do not live up to our um, ideals. And Jean-Paul Sartre, in his preface to Fanon, says, if humanism is to survive, it will survive in what we now call the colonies. It will have a black, a brown, a yellow face, because in Europe, with Auschwitz, we have killed it. Okay. So we, all of this to say that 
this idea of Europe, if grounded, can produce very generative uh, spin-offs. And my only commentary to the second part of your question would be, I wouldn't do domination with Bourdieu. And it's not because I'm a student of Foucault that I say this, but Foucault is much better. Because Foucault teaches us that there is never a moment of domination that is it. There is never power without resistance to power. There has never been a moment in European colonialism where the colonized took it passively say, thank you, sir, whip me some more. Never. There's power, resistance to power, always simultaneously. There's the French Revolution, there is the Haitian Revolution, to Saint Louverture, French Revolution, Olympe de Gouges, both of them get killed, but hey, nobody's perfect, but it's simultaneous. Um, so I think this is the simultaneity of power and resistance to power that is our method to push these old ideals into the future. Bourdieu is too static. It's, it, it just doesn't get it, but it's a more sort of academic discussion. Thank you. Uh, there was a gentleman there with, with a question. Uh, yeah, uh, Professor Rosie, uh, uh, I tend to think that, uh, you know, when you're talking about what we choose to forget or uh, what we sort of choose to remember to forget, I tend to believe that you, what you are uh, exercising is, to borrow a phrase from Ashish Nandi, is the principle of principled forgetfulness. That uh, you talk about the horrors that we under the 30s have managed to escape, but you're not talking really about the horrors that we are sort of living in, that, that this dream of the EU sort of uh, sells about how we, you being a student of Foucault, uh, we sort of get normalized into believing in this dream uh, through, through a manufacturing sort of consent and through this conduct. And uh, how sort of this this dream of freedom of uh, freedom and everything sort of gets consumed by the same uh, uh, dream, and therefore I tend to think that although you're you're trying to sing a world into existence, but you're not really talking about the inherent contradictions in that folklore. Uh, to sort of uh, to Professor Engin. Uh, I, I realize that when you're talking about the citizenship, uh, it's more inclusive, but uh, uh, I also tend to think that you uh, doing this would uh, mean not recognizing difference, and uh, therefore it will end up becoming a very homogeneous uh, category. And therefore by this idea of citizenship, you essentially making it a very biopolitical category, that bringing in more bodies, bringing in more uh, heads to this idea will then give legitimacy to the acts of that uh, uh, sort of union or to that uh, uh, body that controls these uh, bodies. So how would you both react if I were to say that both of your projects are of failing design? That's my question. Um, I'm not sure that I understand the first part of your um, question. What I call the dream in inverted commas is a serious political project. It's a serious political project that is rooted in the defeat of European fascism and the Second World War, with all the implications for decolonization, the things we've talked about. It has legal documents, it has historical documents, so to call it a dream is a little bit of, a, as I said, a provocation, because I do think that there is a negative uh, representation of this particular project. In fact, I don't even think, well, I'll have to hear from you. I believe that most of you don't even think of the European Union as a political project anymore. It's a dead horse in some ways, which is, I think, part of the problem of the social imaginary that I was trying to reactivate. I did talk about the internal contradictions of the project because the project is, in a sense, a, a, a humongous attempt at transforming centuries of intra-European hostility that are rooted in nationalism, the virus of nationalism. I believe it's not unique to Europe. I mean, nationalism is rampant in the world today, wherever you look. Um, uh, but I do think that Europeans, because of the horrors of two world wars and a particular form of colonialism, um, have a duty to account for their history. I'm quoting here Etienne Balibar. We are the continent that needs to be accountable for its history. Maybe other continents will do it too, but we need to get started. Europe is condemned to its history. 
and we are condemned to transforming that history into something viable. And if we are to be accountable for the mistakes that we made as well as the wonderful things that we've done, it's not all negative. I think that particular definition of, of Europe that I think Engin also referred to, which you find in Derrida, in L'Autre Cap, the other heading, um, Europe is the place that has to re -trans redefine itself and account for itself. Um, uh, and it has the ability to do so because we're a very old and very well-documented culture. We hope that other cultures will do the same. I think the Chinese could do some of this as well. But um, it's not for us to say. We have a historical responsibility to do that. So it is asking a lot. As my British friend says, that's asking for a lot. That's, that will take a lot of evenings, they say, they say um, uh, all the time. But in some ways, the British Empire, because of the enormous input of the post-colonial theory, has done some of that revision reluctantly, but the, um, the European empires have not, and I would have a lot to say about empires, the, the, the pre, the, the 1913 one, as well as the, um, uh, the, the, the subsequent one. I think empires are crucial to this, and every European uh, nation state had its own empire. Even Italy, with Albania and Somalia, great. Um, uh, Scandinavia had its own empire, Denmark, Sweden, major colonial powers. Um, so I think there is a need to map the extent of that European uh, imperialism, almost state by state. Do I want to talk about Belgium? Um, uh, but when, when did the scholarship on Belgian Congo start? Yesterday, literally. Um, now, uh, the first thesis, the first studies come out 10, 15 years ago, ridiculous. Um, uh, if you know the state of the Congo and everything concerned with that. So a long way to go for those internal contradictions, but I think it is our task as academics, as scholars, as intellectuals, to simply say this is the road to go, road, the way to go. It will take time, it's not an easy road, but unless we revisit the locations of our own contradiction historically and hold ourselves accountable, then there cannot be a European Union and that makes sense for the citizens, for our own self-representation. There will only be a legalistic economic union which nobody cares for, but at the deep deepest roots of our self-representation, this is the way to go, and accounting for those conditions. A totally good question, and which I can only partially answer. Thank you. Um, you're asking about the question of um, inclusiveness versus difference. If we constitute an idea of citizenship as all-inclusive, does it not run the risk of eliminating differences because everyone is expected to be included under certain terms, perhaps leaving their differences behind? Um, I don't think we need to articulate the problem again as an either or problem. It doesn't have to be when people are included, included only those terms that they passively accept. Um, think of European citizenship as a possibility and there are performative possibilities in it. Once it is extended to people, once it is given as a resource to them, there is no, um, there is no guarantee of how it will be brought into being performatively. And it is in that space of the lack of guarantee, it is in that gap that all the creative uh, potential resides. It is that creative potential that needs to be opened up for people. Um, when we don't open up that creative potential, what we are left with is a binary. Those who are included, and they are only included in terms that are given to them, and this serves member states and their nationality fiction really well. Because the performative space of citizenship is not opened, a British government can say that British jobs are for British people, or that they can talk about Bulgarians and Romanians um, should not be allowed into uh, uh, Britain, or when they are allowed, it should be under certain circumstances. It finds itself in positions where it is given that right to limit their inclusivity. That's what the argument is about, allowing people to have that performative space in which they can creatively invest. Now, once people given the space, to performatively and creatively engage themselves, we know that humans are too creative to eliminate differences. They come into it with all their differences and perform them in the most uh, unexpected and surprising ways. And it is in that unsurprising uh, element 
that the potential of citizenship as performative space resides. That's what um, then the risk is really not there to worry about the inclusiveness. It's not an either or question. There were, I think the two people there were first in the beige jacket and the, the scarf, so. <laughs> well, uh, do I need to decide? Okay, so I think, I think you, were, you were first. <laughs> I'm Shannon Fulman. I work at the European Network Against Racism, and I really am thankful for your presentations today. Um, it, I think, would fit in very nicely to get this sort of feedback from you to feed into our progressive narrative for equality and diversity, which I think is another uh, kind of another term for selling what you're proposing. Um, and what I hear repeatedly in the last conferences I've been going to is this need for a, a future vision. And, and that's something that we're trying to achieve with our progressive narrative for equality. And in this, we have proposed three main elements of, the manifest, uh, of our manifesto, which is about full equality, solidarity, and well-being. And I think when we consider these last questions also about inclusion and difference, that aspect of well-being is very important in kind of um, alleviating those problems. And so you have to ask all these questions, what is needed for well-being in Europe? And uh, again, all of those presentations that um, came earlier, I think, would feed into that. But the challenge that we've been having is one, trying to find courageous politicians who will adopt these messages that you've been uh, speaking on. And it's sad that not more um, politicians are in the room. The question is, how can we get them to hear your messages and our messages? How can we get them to take them on? Because there's not so many courageous politicians as Juru Tavares um, who will put these messages out there and spread the, the messages. And, and the other question is, how, what strategies would you have for us in particular as we try to counter um, far right, far left tendencies um, and win the popular vote <laughs> or the popular support of these ideas of equality and solidarity and, and differences, diversity is great. Um, what messages, sound bites, what strategies would you have for us to spread the word and, and inspire people, as Rosie was saying, we need to do in the start of her presentation? So I thank you for any support in that regard. Thank you. Did your next door neighbor have a, a remark as well? Maybe we can take two or three together and then we come back. Yeah? Hi, I'm uh, Anya Topolsky, and I'm a researcher from Leuven on uh, parallels between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Um, and so we've had students of Bourdieu and Foucault. I'm a student of Hannah Arendt. And so there's two, um, there's two issues in her work that I would like to hear your thoughts on. Uh, one of them is what we've heard mentioned several times with Cyprus, the Steel and Coal Union, the Euro, the relationship in the European past and present between politics and economics. That's a really important juncture that we need to discuss, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, the other is the importance, I mean, Hannah Arendt is a phenomenologist, space and time. When you've talked about the future of Europe, the dream, you've been really talking in spatial terms, right? Residential, deterritorialized citizenship movement. So it's been a very spatial concept of Europe to come. When you talk about Europe's past, you've been talking about temporality, history, memory. Now the question is, is this a rupture? I mean, is this Adorno saying there's a rupture between Europe's past after Shoah and Europe's future? Or is there some sort of relationship? Can we bring this historical and spatial element of what we're talking about together? Thank you. Maybe we take one more. Uh, we've had Arendt, Bourdieu, Foucault so far. If someone can come up with another, <laughs> please go, go. Unfortunately, my question isn't related to another thinker. Um, I'm Olivia Burdock, by the way, University of Edinburgh. Uh, my question is more about the nature of the, of the conference today and the role of uh, architects of European citizenship. The conference is called Enacting Citizenship. This is the year of European citizens. But my impression is what we are talking here to, uh, what we are talking uh, about here today is the elite and 
and perhaps we are trying to establish or build an architecture of European citizenship without necessarily engaging with the question about um, European citizens. So what is the role of European citizens and is there a role for them at all or, are, or is the European Union and Europe uh, essentially an elite driven project and we are going to make the, the architecture of citizenship in which case we have a problem and the problem is uh, that the current crisis is really about uh, trying to find new ways of engagement of politics and, and can we achieve this in a way that is feasible uh, or whether this will, do you think, this will come automatically when we establish a vision where the European Union is, come, uh, is going? Because at the moment it seems to me that that's what we're discussing. Thank you. Thanks. So maybe if we have uh, some responses and then we try and take in another round and, and come back again. So relatively brief responses. Rui, first. Okay. Uh, there, there's something funny about our, our age. People go into a tattoo parlor, for instance, and make a tattoo that stays on their skin forever. And do, you know, decide about that in five minutes. But it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to sell an idea to people. That, you know, everybody gets, uh, uh, you know, gives a step backward and says, hmm, I, am I going to buy into this European citizenship idea? And that's... The, if you think about that, it's, it's, a, it's a feature of our, of our age. It has explanations. We have been sold ideas before and they were terrible. And we've, did, we, we've done terrible things with, this, with these ideas. And we don't want to commit to them. On the other hand, it leaves a huge empty room to all intolerances and all the even worse ideas that we are now seeing creeping up. Uh, so. Of course, the idea of a co cosmopolitan pat patriotism has lots of, of holes in it. They have been identified by our, our first questioners. It's true. They are not perfect. There are things here that I say as a, a politician that I would never say as an historian. They are you know, technically too uh, quick and dirty, too fuzzy to say as an historian. But if I'm going to wait for something that I can say in a technically perfect way as an historian, a philosopher, or what, or what not, I'll have a, another war or, uh, in Europe before that. That was the discovery that our uh, ancestors like uh, Thomas Mann or Stefan Zweig or others made. Uh, so some, if you want to involve citizens, you have to make an appeal to what I call the European promise. The European promise in 1989 uh, uh, was that uh, if your country slides back to a dictatorship, your European brothers and sisters will help that country because they want the other European countries to do the same. Uh, so in a sense, I think that only the European project can save us, but before we have to save the European project, and before saving the European project, people have to care about the European project. Uh, which is not easy. So we have like this huge time bomb. I sometimes have the, exp the, 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 the impression when I go on debates about the European Union that I'm trying to explain how the time bomb works. Nobody knows how the Council works. The Council is actually two institutions, the Council of the European Union and the European Council. In the Council of the European Union who makes law, actually finishes the laws when they want to finish. They have a tacit veto over everything that the European Parliament does. If you go to the Indian Union, the equivalent to the Council has 14 days to pronounce itself on laws from the, from the lower chamber. Here it can take forever, so they have a veto. And then you start explaining about co repair two and one, and Jai Council and whatever, it's too difficult. So this time bomb that can explode over our heads uh, as its instructions written in a language that is so complicated and so difficult and people don't like that language because they, they have been force-fed that language from Eurocrats for 20 or 30 years, that people say, well, maybe, maybe it's better not to care about it. That would be a very wrong idea, very wrong indeed, because if this thing explodes, then, you know, it's... Uh, uh, going back to this idea of the crisis, you can disrupt the life of a generation over some very bad decisions by politicians. We've seen that in 1913, 1914. We've seen that again and again in European history. So 
what do I think? I think that either there are no politicians in this room or either all of you are politicians. And if, either, if all of you are politicians, you are going to make mistakes. Hopefully not the mistakes of Stalinism and uh, whatever, but you know, some mistakes. Some of your ideas will be good now and then you'll think about them and in five years maybe they are not good. But you cannot run the risk of inaction. Uh, so the question, the same question that all of you asked in different ways is the same that I've been, that I've been asking myself. I asked Nicolo this the other day when we, when we spoke about this event. How can we create an European spring? Very difficult one. You cannot do it in a laboratory, but we need it. And in a sense, it's relatively, easily, relatively easy to ask for Egyptian democracy when you have an Egypt, Egyptian dictatorship. But it's difficult to ask for European democracy when you don't have an European dictatorship. You don't have an European anything, if you think about it. But we do need that European spring. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Very good. Have you, you, we need at least a spring. <laughs> we need a spring, and I, I saw Engin shaking his head about whether we have a, a European dictatorship or not, I think was what the, <laughs> uh, at least in the minds of the people. Engin. Uh, yeah, I think there is a European authoritarianism in, in the offing. So, uh, but I would like to. Um, respond to these questions in a reverse order. Um, the third question on the question of architecture of citizenship and particularly the nature of this conference and why use the term enact but really reflect on it on theoretical um, uh, terms. I think that's an excellent question to remind us uh, some of the aims of the conference and what we want to accomplish. Um, although our discussion is focused on broader issues of uh, European citizenship. That term, enacting European citizenship, comes from a project precisely animated by what you just said, the difference between the architecture of citizenship and enacted citizenship by people who actually claim the space of citizenship for themselves. And they do, uh, they do uh, interesting repertoires of action, as it were, to claim. Just to give you an example, I will talk more about it this afternoon, but um, one would not naturally think Kurdish uh, minority groups in Turkey as European citizens, but there is very good record of them taking their case to European Court of Human Rights and claiming Europeanness, European citizenship and Turkish citizenship simultaneously. Similarly, amongst the Roma and Sinti people, organizing themselves, whether it's occupying a, a park in Berlin, whether it is about occupying um, a space in Rome, they have also engaged in uh, creative actions. So then the question becomes not so much as the architecture of citizenship articulated from uh, top down, but what image or imaginary of citizenship is being articulated by those who claim that citizenship by their actions is the spirit of that project. And in, in, a, in a sense, in this conference, we are now reflecting on broader principles of citizenship that comes out of that um, uh, uh, specific studies, but the specific studies really are the important aspect of that. So I would uh, welcome an opportunity to further discuss why that shift of focus from architecture to enactment. Um, on the second question, uh, concerning our end. Uh, the question of space-time is too complicated to enter into for me, but I'm going to answer just the question of the relationship between politics and economics. I think it's really poignant at this moment, because when you think about the European project and its crisis now, although we just use the term crisis as a shorthand to describe all that is happening, it is also important what is actually crisis is about. Is it really broadly the European project or a particular appro approach there or, or specific strategies that have been adopted by the European Union, especially European Commission, over the last um, 10 years or so? And here, Arendt is really poignant precisely because of pointing out that a project of a polity 
constituting a polity cannot be conceived in singular terms, either political or economic. Political foundations of a polity are just as important as economic foundations of it. And if we consider a polity only existing for economic reasons, or if we consider a polity being animated and made possible only as a response to economic rationality, we would be robbing the polity one of its most fundamental aspects, which is politics. And when you look at the last 10 years, this is rather too simple uh, caricature of our end, but nonetheless that relationship between or mutual dependence of the political and the social and economic are significant. Now when we look at what has failed in Europe over the last 10 years, is the image of Europe as an economic rationality. What the project has been over the last 10 years, what has been hijacked by, if you like, is the dream of separating the economic project of the um, European Union and imagining it as a common market and removing the politics or the political from that project, considering that this is a technical legal project. If we achieve the economic market and if we provide economic, uh, European citizenship as a form of free movement, which is a necessary precondition of an, a common market, then everything else would sort itself out. This project has failed. It is the crisis of the neoliberal conception of Europe as a market sans politics has failed. This is important to realize. So when we use the term crisis, when we use the term um, failure, also it is important to underline what has actually uh, failed. To think that European project has failed and has the difficulty of buying into um, this separation of the political from economics and accepting it as given. And it is that accepted givenness that we have to also reject. We have to cl clarify and qualify what the failure is and the crisis is precisely about. And on the first question, Michelle, what, what, uh, stra uh, what strategies, what sound bites you said, what messages for equality in diversity and how to get the message across? It's a very difficult to, um, and, um, question to answer, partially because I live my life primarily as an academic and I produce ideas, but I'm not so very good at communicating to them different publics. I know, when, I know my public when I see it, and that's the university public. I can communicate. But outside that, I'm, I'm fish out of water. I don't know. And in the UK, particularly in the university sector, there's this intense pressure on academics to be able to actually just exact the opposite, to be able to communicate to all publics in all transparency. I don't believe it is possible. I don't believe that that is a, an achievable uh, aim. Be that as it may, um, one of the things that at least academically in my work try to do, instead of articulating messages myself, shift the focus of the work that we do on people who have those messages themselves in their deeds, in things that they do, and create a kind of methodology where we can read these as acts and create an archive of acts of things that people do when they claim citizenship and communicate that vocabulary to those publics that might be interested and uh, and um, intrigued by those messages. So instead of articulating messages, I found an easier space for me to communicate, to appoint myself as a mediator. Rather than create the messages and communicate to the publics, or at least arrogate to think that I'm communicating with publics with whom I don't really have a rapport, um, I have appointed myself as a mediator between those deeds people commit when they act, enact citizenship, and those who need to hear about it. And I don't know if that answers your question. 
Thank you. Rosie. Wonderful. A footnote to that. Um, what should we tell to our politicians? Wonderful three points, full equality, solidarity, well-being, terrific. Um, it's a question of discursive registers. I think, as you know very well, the entire de public debate on citizenship has a very legalistic, formal, and very, very dry style. We were discussing this with Misha in the, in the break. It is very difficult to intervene with experimental or speculative schemes. And this is why this idea of the archive of acts of, of citizenship is quite brilliant. Uh, put on top of that, the idea that our context at present is rather anti-theory. Um, it's not only post theory, it's really anti theory. So if you come in with a speculative scheme, so you're going to be hit in the face by what people call realism, which is nothing but a, a rejection of anything that could be new and experimental. And, and the extent to which realism has been one of the uh, methodological tools of neoliberal economics to flatten out any other possible alternative scenarios really needs to be put on the agenda. So there is here, I think, a need, particularly from people from the humanities and social sciences, to bring in the cultural roots of citizenship, the importance of images, representations, memories, and, uh, food, songs, sport, all the things that excite people's um, imaginings. And we need to bring the juice of cultural practices back into the formal discourses of citizenship. I think that's what we need to do from our fields of, of inquiry, and it's going to be an uphill battle if I know anything about my law faculty back home. Uh, Anya on um, Hannah Arendt, your great love. Interesting, complicated. Politics and economics, I completely um, support everything uh, Engin said. I just wanted to add that particularly in the origins of totalitarianism, Arendt gives us a series of um, cartographies, as I would call them, of attempts to unify Europe. She, she, she talks about the, the Roman Europe and the Nazi Europe, and, uh, the, the First World War Europe that was a global player, a global um, major colonial player. And then she talks about the attempts to go beyond that. She talks eloquently about the role of banking in unifying Europe, specifically the Rothschild Bank that she knew perfectly well. Um, Rothschild Bank that we know from the research done by Catherine Hall, totally different field of inquiry, but the work that Catherine Hall is doing on slavery has shown the role of the Rothschild Bank in issuing the bonds that allowed slavery to be abolished in um, the UK um, by, by basically compensating um, the owners of slaves for the loss of their capital. So follow the Rothschilds and you get a very interesting, um, it's very interesting in our end, the extent to which she really focuses on this kind of um, banking, um, diasporic Jewish moment of constructing another Europe, very relevant today, um, follow the money could be in the part of that. Uh, a lot more on our end, but we shall leave it for this afternoon. The second part of your question, however, is more problematic. The spatial vision of the future and the temporal vision of the past. I don't quite see it that way. For me, of course, in the, in the everyday language, when you talk about the past, time intervenes a great deal uh, uh, more, more obviously, but the past is very, very spatial. As in, in this particular discussion, um, uh, the temporal dimension is embedded in concrete um, uh, territorial <clears throat> realities. I'll give you some examples of that. The legacy of the great empires um, uh, in the daily lives of Europeans. I am from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I come from that part of northeastern Italy that was Austro-Hungarian for centuries and has been Italian only for 150 years and even then we want out because we don't even know where Rome is and uh, let alone love it. Uh, when I go to Krakow um, I, or Budapest I feel far more at home than when I go to Bologna, Rome or Naples and I think I can speak for thousands if not millions of Europeans. The imprint of those empires, the Ottoman, the Prussian, the Austro-Hungarian, the Tsar they were there for centuries. Um, and I think the traces of that history in language, in dialects, in food, in music is enormous. And I think it's returning now in this post-nationalist moment. And I'll give you a concrete example of how the European Union makes this um, uh, real. My own region then, the northeast of Italy, has created
created a euro region with the south of Austria and Slovenia, so the richest regions in Europe. Um, and it is a euro region that is not a nation state, is not just a peripheral region, is a major player, backed by the European um, uh, sort of t constitution and an and, and, and understanding of um, what counts as the absence of national boundaries. I think we need to look at the territoriality of the past um, a lot more uh, uh, carefully. How to bridge the two praxis, and I think Engin talks about performances, I talk about praxis, practices, um, uh, pragmatic practices to be accountable for this, the, the, both the spatial and the temporal dimension of our history and move on, praxis, doing, um, enacting. So I'm a, I'm a Deleuzean affirmative politics, um, get your hands dirty, do something. Let's go for lunch. I'm told that <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can vote on it. I'm told that we have <laughs> potentially enough time for another couple of questions, remarks, if, if we want. But I, I'm aware that the lunch proposition is also a very strong argument. So, OK, please, uh, maybe if we take two quickly, uh, and then, then we come back, then we go for lunch. So please go ahead. Yeah. Um, in your opening remarks, um, Professor Rose, that you um, made a diagnosis which I think is quite um, perceptive of those who are with anti-European um, sentiments, so to speak. And one of them you mentioned was the leftist camp, uh, which would rather look at the um, European handling of other conflicts and democracy deficits rather than it, in the ones in its own backyard. And um, what I wanted to say is, uh, I think they are very much linked. I think there's probably much more danger of coming um, of fascism coming from abroad, as you have mentioned earlier. I'm not sure which one of the speakers did uh, mention that. Then inside, because the, the debate today, the political debate in Europe is very Eurocentric as usual and, um, and it also always looks at the democracy deficit from a very European way, if that is even a, a way of describing it. And today the European, U the, the European Union looks at the, the events in the Arab world, especially the spring, with, with a lot of confusion precisely for that reason. And one of the, the products of the collective imagi imaginary that um, I think uh, Mr. Tafravez, Taf <laughs> sorry if I pronounced it wrong, um, actually produced is when he said, we want a, a European spring. And, and that is an interesting point because the European Union, uh, or as the Union, um, perceives its role in its global outreach as, um, as also a production of power. I mean, it's, they call it normative power, or so does the literature um, call it or describe it. But in fact, it does speak to the democracy deficit within Europe, because maybe Europe has been, or European Union has been an economic and monetary union, but I'm not sure it has ever been a political one. I'm not sure even if, if that was a concrete part of the vision, because the accumulative process of establishing the European Union has produced things that we didn't know in the post-Westphalian uh, structure would have actually be produced. So with, with those things in, 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 in play, I think that the democracy deficit in Europe is much more linked, and organically so, to its global role, especially in what it calls uh, Near East, which is also a very Eurocentric view of the world, and obviously its own neighborhood, and and precisely in those who study the Euro the Euro Mediterranean and later the Euro European neighborhood policy and how this whole power construction has been into play. I would like to hear your points, um, your comments on that. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe uh, just one more brief point. I, someone here, yeah. So uh, very quickly, I just think we are skipping a, an important point, which is the delivery part. As I don't come from the academic world, I don't come from the social sciences world, I think we are discussing it and I think maybe we are risking to always discuss these aspects in small circles with people that have more or less the same opinion or the same general idea. And Anne Charlotte, in the beginning, she referred that for the European Year of Citizens, they've done a manifesto, okay, they will produce a document in the end of the year and they are doing some events. But my question is, how are we reaching people with these events? The people that maybe they're also... Uh, 
in favor of uh, Federalist Europe, but how do we touch them? Just by doing these events, I'm asking how many of us here are against what we are saying this morning? Maybe none. <coughs> so it's important oh, yeah, also the delivery yeah. part. And then uh, a very uh, nice um, term that uh, Rosie uh, explained, the imaginary, so the European social imaginary. And you quote, I think, Gilroy, correct me if I'm wrong, that he said that fascism was colonialism coming home. Mm. So I think at this point in the North Europe, er, Europe the, they, they think that Europe is crisis coming home, and us in the South, we think that Europe is uh, austerity coming home. <laughs> so again, is the delivery, the delivery part here. How can we reach the people? in different aspects because they, they think about completely different, um, they have completely different perspectives of, uh, of Europe. So how can we, how can we go with them? And then uh, Engin, uh, about the non-Europeans, I think it's a very, very important point. And then when you asked about Turkey, exactly what happened to the Turkey question, we don't discuss it anymore. And a different thing, I'm, like Rui, I come from Portugal, and there's a thing we, we forget or we don't know, if you draw a direct line from Lisbon, the closest capital is Rabat, it's not Madrid. So how can we also, or better, what can we ask from the non-European countries? What can we offer them? And what can we ask the, them to offer us? I think it's an important aspect. aspect. And just to close, regarding the... I think it's enough, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I would love that we could talk uh, all afternoon, but we also have okay. the lunch to, to discuss during. So if you, if you don't mind, I will. No, no. Uh, I'm pleased at least with, with, with the very first uh, question that you made about the, the delivery and what it is we can do, because that was one of the things I said that we should try and get to. One thing I, I take the privilege of being able to speak to uh, say is one thing we can do is to run a festival, which my organization does, Trans Europe a Festival, which is precisely an attempt uh, to run a festival simultaneously throughout Europe, which takes these ideas and mixes them with culture and cuisine and football and all, all kinds of other festive activities as a way of uh, enacting the ideas in an alternative uh, form than this kind of very discursive way, which is, uh, so that's my contribution to how we can, what we can do to reach other audiences. Um, maybe the other panelists have uh, some quick uh, contributions about what we can do or the other issues raised. I have a very quick one on the leftist Euroscepticism, and I would delegate all the political issues to her um, host. Um, I do think that there is a rising Euroscepticism on the part of the left, and I think you, you mentioned a, different, a divided left. It has to do with the current state of what we used to call critical theory, sociopolitical theory, which has become an exercise in cynicism and negativity. Um, like in big, great big neon uh, lights. Um, uh, you can always score a laugh and, and, a, and a sound bite by making fun of the European Union project. See Zizek, she, see Badiou, see these people who just return to Marxist-Leninism because they've got nothing else to say. And, may, and they make mockery of 30 years of alternative social political theory developed by feminists, by anti-racists, by post-colonialists, by the peace movement, by the anti-war movement, that they delete at one stroke of their beautiful French pens. So bad masters really in intoxicating what's left of the left into a Eurosceptical mode that is completely sterile. It leads us nowhere and, and deletes 30 years of the rest of critical theory, which they dismiss as merely cultural studies. Oh. So I think here we have to do a very careful um, cartography of the discursive, the political economy of our discursive practices and what is being included and excluded in the rising industry of Euroscepticism. I delegate to higher wisdom on the other issues. Okay, sure, Engin. I will, I will pick one on the question of what can we ask non-Europeans to contribute to the European project. I think that's a genuine question. Uh, we have not really attempted that in, in, uh, in all seriousness, and we really don't know how to go about it. Um, the, the Europe's relationship to non-European spaces is really a problematic one. We inherit a, a tradition where our way of relating to non-European cultures, whether it's Middle East, China, India, not only history of colonialism and imperialism, but as I keep insisting, Orientalism, which means holding it inferiority. And it is very difficult to come bring that around. If you look at, for example, coverage about China, you know, we 
we incorporate it in such a self-evident way that did you notice that, for example, despite the fact that technical people say that this cannot be demonstrated clearly, most newspapers almost every other day claim that cyber attacks originate from China. Just imagine this uh, senseless repetition does to our understanding of this dark space China and its authoritarian rule and how it is constantly involved in cyber attacks. And one can give many more examples like this. Our relationship to non-European cultures, non-European spaces is a deeply problematic one, uh, almost bordering on pathology. And it is that which we need to address continually with the uh, project of uh, the social imaginary of Europe. How do we go about it is a really difficult one, your question about um, delivery. But constantly reading what is provided not only in the media, but as Rosie says, in um, the academic space, in a contrapuntal way, as Edward Said used to say. There are, there are um, challenging all uh, uh, challenging spaces also for those images that we constantly communicated uh, about other spaces, of other spaces in the world. And we have to bring those into our discursive spaces. That's why I insist every time we start talking about Europe, let's, let's actually begin with non-Europe. How does non-Europe figure here in this space in articulating ourselves, ourselves in relation to the European project? Yes, thank you. Let, let's start with non-Europe uh, after our first question. Uh, there's a very paradoxic way in the treatment that that Near East or so-called Near East gets from the European Union. On the one hand, it's a projection, it, it's a, pro, uh, let's say, a deluded projection of power. On the other hand, it does not exist. If you think, for instance, of the way that Greece, Italy, and Spain, and Portugal are treated as peripherals. These countries are only peripherals if you think that there is nothing else on the other side of the Mediterranean. It's a black hole. There's nothing there. The world stops there. And hence, Greece and Cyprus, indeed, the southern Italy, etc., are, are the backwaters, are the dead ends, because nothing else can be done with the other side of the, of the Mediterranean. Whereas, historically, it has never been a black hole. There, there was always conflict and exchanges and uh, cultural exchanges, economic exchanges, etc. From the time of of Raman Lulli and and, uh, and Maimonides and 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 Averroes, of the three uh, big religions there, and of course th there will be nothing easier uh, in order to help the peripherals much easier than a, than a bailout than to just get a good act together and change the policies, the, our border policies with Libya and Egypt and Israel and Palestine and Morocco and get more people coming and get more people going and doing business, whatever, you can even, I, 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 I'm so agnostic on that that even coming from the, from the, uh, from the left, even the far left, some will say, do a single market in the Mediterranean, whatever you want. But do not use that part of the world as just a passive recipient of policies. <clears throat> Learn some lessons. That's why I insist in the European Spring. We, what we have to do is to import that experience, localize it, but uh, you know, clearly uh, recognize that what we are doing is just learning on the footsteps of the people that were uh, on Tahrir Square, not in, not in a simplistic way, but doing what people have always done, which is get those experiences, transform them, process them, filter them with our own experience, and deliver them to, uh, to a different polity, which is this strange beast that we have in, in Europe. Um, as to the, to the left, the, the left has become now a machine for ensuring that the right wing gets all they want. You know, either the center left or the far left. 
You know, coming from Portugal, I would imagine that the left wing in my country would be united by the possibility of the IMF coming to the country. If that, you know, either that or Satan himself coming to, to, to the country would unite. No, not at all. They're more divided than ever. They give me all kinds of historical excuses for being divided. But actually, none of these excuses fly. Because in, 19, in, in 89, one month before the Berlin Wall came, Lisbon was governed by a coalition of socialists, communists, Trotskyists, Maoists, ecologists, etc. They were all together. They were working together at that time, and the Cold War was still there. But now they, you know, you, you, when you tell them in Iceland, the left wing decided on a plan to take the country out of the mess the country was, was heading to. I, I had the, 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 the finance minister, who's the leader of the left wing, of the far left party in Iceland, telling me that, well, what I had to say to the IMF was, we were a Scandinavian welfare society, and we got drunk with this Anglo-Saxon capitalism, and now we want to get back home as soon as possible, and we want, we'll have you here, we want to get rid of you as soon as possible, and go back to where we think we belong. I tell this to, 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 to my leftist friends in Portugal, treason, it's terrible. The Greeks, they've been calling them names to each movement from forever. What do they ensure with this? They ensure that the EPP will go on dominating European politics. They, some say, oh, no, no, now they're even going back to democracy can only work at the level of the nation state. I cannot imagine a more anti-left-wing thing to say. It's, it's abandoning all hope of workers of the world unite. You say, we cannot talk to a guy in Badajoz, you know, 200 kilometers from Lisbon, because he's a Spanish worker. So I, can, I, I, I cannot offer a political view that will be good for the guy in Badajoz and the guy in Krakow. So this is, you know, in my view, they can call them leftists all they want. They are really quitting on the idea, on, on the very idea of the left. And if you don't have European democracy, what you have is Chancellor Merkel on power. Because then you have only a club of democracies, not a democracy. And in a club, it's like kids playing football in the street. I think that many of, of you have had a, that experience. If the ball belongs to everybody, and then you have this very dry, formalistic thing of having rules for the club, or you know who can use the ball and all that, but you know you all bought the ball, and it belongs to every kid playing in the street, if, and that's a democracy. That's what European democracy should be. If you have a club of democracies, then the kid that has the ball, if he doesn't like the rules, just you know, and I'm saying he, it's usually a boy, <laughs> you know, picks the ball and and then and at you know the middle of the game because he doesn't like the way that, that penalties are being scored or whatever. And that's what the left will end up ensuring that the European Union is. A void where lobbies can thrive, where uh, economic power can thrive, where uh, uh, big state power can thrive. If, if the left is still uh, uh, divided and ravished by this, this thought, that as, as Rosie has said, most of this has not even an ideological excuse. It's a purely personal experiential excuse that I don't see myself in that way. I'm not, you know, uh, I, I'm trying to salvage whatever of the past wrong ideas that the left had that we can still have. Uh, but it, it is really a pernicious attitude on the left that will, uh, in, I think, in a sense, doom us all if it goes on being like this. If, if there is not a new, also a, a leftist spring against the authoritarianism of older generations in the left. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for these uh, for these words. Uh, we've reached the end of the the morning session. You'll be pleased to hear that lunch is coming uh, shortly. Before I give you some various informations, perhaps you join me in thanking our, our speakers.